Well, in this session, I want to look at what are the hallmarks of a healthy church. One of the ways I thought we could perhaps do this is uh, it's a bit like when you go on holiday or somewhere and you have your camera with you and you're looking around at some of the features of the place you've gone to, things that really define the place and make it obvious what it is and, and capture it so that people know, oh yes, I recognize that. And what do we do? We take some snapshots. We, we capture some of the main things that we want to remind ourselves of about the place that we've been. And I find that the book of Acts is very much like uh, a picture, a whole uh, set, a gallery, as it were, of snapshots that uh, give us an insight into what healthy church life looked like in the New Testament. And it gives us not only a, a description, but it also gives us a prescription. It gives us something that we can then emulate and contextualize within each subsequent generation. And it wasn't that the church was perfect, it wasn't that it had got everything sorted out. And indeed, all of our Christian lives and the church in general is always work in progress. We are being built into a temple. God is doing something amongst us. And so I hope that in this session, I want to just, uh, as I show, share a few snapshots, I want to just try and inspire us about not only what we are part of, but also inspire us with the destination that we can journey towards. So let's uh, take the first snapshot together and have a look at what the scripture says about word and spirit. Now in uh, the book of Acts in, verse, in chapter 19 verses 8 to 12 we find this about Paul. It says, And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Now, this beautiful blend of the gospel doctrine that they heard the word of the Lord with this combined uh, revealing of the manifest presence and power of God, the manifest presence and power of the risen Christ can be seen together. God was doing extraordinary miracles through Paul as he taught uh, daily from uh, the scriptures and taught them of the gospel. Now, obviously, when I talk about the work of the Spirit, I'm not suggesting that all the Holy Spirit does is the dramatic breakthroughs of signs and wonders and healings, as we read about in the Lecture Hall of Tyrannus account. There's a broad landscape to everything the Holy Spirit does. The fact that we even know Jesus at all is an amazing miracle. There is no greater miracle. We were spiritually dead. We were not alive to God, we were without God, without hope in the world and totally unable to save ourselves or come to know Christ except for a resurrection that takes place spiritually by the power of the Holy Spirit. Alongside that he emboldens us from fearful trembling believers into those who can find ourselves able to proclaim the gospel in lots of different situations that he leads us into. We also find that the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which certainly can't come about in an instant sort of encounter with God, but takes time to grow within our lives as we're transformed from one degree of glory to another. That fruit of the Spirit is no less dramatic and uh, miraculous than any immediate healing. So when someone who through encounter with the Holy Spirit over a period of time, seeking to walk and follow Christ in daily life, becomes more full of Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, long-suffering, all the things, gentleness, self-control, all the things that we're told are the fruits of the Spirit, that is a powerful manifestation of the Holy Spirit's work on earth in the life of God's people. Again, a generalized observation that as the gospel was preached, as mission went forward, 
God also uh, signposted the reality. He brought uh, validation of what was being said by demonstrating his power through the church on mission. And going back to the lecture hall of Tyrannus, we're told that all of Asia heard the word uh, as Paul both spoke and demonstrated something. He left them. The point was he left them there and everywhere else. A pattern, a model, uh, a, a, a way of doing things that they had seen. Now, it would be very remiss of him to be behaving in that way if he did not intend that that would be a pattern that they would then take from there and go and replicate. Indeed, when Paul is talking uh, in 2 Timothy 3, 14, he says, as for you, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it. So he says, look, what you've, what you've learned from me, I want you to be confident in that and keep teaching it, build upon it. And then in Philippians 4, verse 9, he says, whatever you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. In other words, he's encouraging uh, people to emulate the pattern of ministry, the philosophy of ministry that he's been demonstrating again and again. And it would seem to me that a straightforward reading of the scriptures gives us ample evidence that Paul not only preached the word, but by the power of the Spirit, he then demonstrated the authenticity of the gospel that he was proclaiming. And I would make this plea that the snapshot we want to look at in this first point is that the word of God and the Spirit of God belong together as we go forward in mission. And I would say, brothers and sisters, perhaps as we look out across the nations of Europe and long for a move of God, perhaps it is time when we, with fresh vision, with fresh confidence and with fresh wisdom and discernment that comes from the Holy Spirit himself, begin to say, Father, would you help us to bring word and spirit together, not only in our belief, but in our practice? And I believe that just as Paul saw remarkable effects, remarkable spread of the gospel and church planting across the places that he went, we likewise will see far more fruitfulness for our mission when word and spirit come together. And the second snapshot, if we pick up our imaginary spiritual camera and take a picture again, the second snapshot I want us to look at is that of grace and worship. What does a healthy church look like? Well, it looks like one built on grace and worship. Now, the foundation of our faith is the remarkable grace of God given to us. And that's not just a belief. It's actually something that affects the whole atmosphere, not just of our personal lives, but our corporate life together. A church that is saturated with the awareness of the remarkable grace of God to us is liberating. It is law and legalism crushing. It is utterly uh, breathtaking and it motivates us actually to serve God with great vigor. Now, I grew up in a quite a legalistic Christian setting. And to me, it was utterly liberating to discover the grace of God to me in Christ. If I may just read from Terry Virgo's book, Restoration in the Church, he says, the problem for many Christians is that they always feel condemned. And the answer to condemnation is never simply to improve our performance. It is to reckon on our position through grace. God has justified us freely as a gift. Condemnation is to do with guilt, not with feelings or improved performance. If we, through grace, are declared not guilty by God, then we cannot be condemned. Only the guilty man stands condemned. It is God who justifies, and if God has declared us not guilty, Satan cannot take us to a higher court. There is none. There is no condemnation for us, not because we've been doing well lately or because we have set ourselves a new standard, but because we are in Christ Jesus. He has carried our guilt on the cross. And the more we come to enjoy that truth, the more we will know how to refuse Satan's constant barrage of accusations aimed at getting us down. That's a remarkable insight. 
And the grace of God, when a church gets this, a grace, when the grace of God really becomes deeply embedded in our understanding, it is utterly liberating. Now, some people might say, yes, but uh, actually we need a bit of law just to make sure that we don't all go uh, off the rails and start sinning and becoming very loose about how we live. Well, that's not actually what the Bible teaches us. The Bible actually says to us that we must consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. It says that we um, must understand that our position in Christ. But more than that, we find in Titus 2, verse 11 and 12, it says that it's the grace of God that teaches us to say no to ungodliness. In other words, the more we understand who we are in Christ, the more we understand the new nature that we now have that can say no to sin, that has resurrection power of God within us, that our old nature has been crucified. It no longer dominates us. We now are alive with Christ. We have the life of God living within us. We can by that grace of God, that resurrection power, say no to sin. And grace, the more we drink from that stream, motivates us more and more to say, do you know what? There is nothing better than knowing Christ. I will say no to all the things that might tempt me. Now, of course, we are work in progress. We go from glory to glory. We are being sanctified. But the essence of our faith is this. We have been made justified and declared not guilty. Uh, through the work of Christ on the cross. And that's a liberating thing for any church to become uh, deeply um, aware of. So then when it comes to grace, the, 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 the fruit of grace is worship. Worship is not just about singing concepts. It is about encounter. It is about engaging with the God who brings us near and who draws uh, near to us Uh, not as some distant uh, being, but as an intimate uh, lover of our souls. And God has brought us near by adopting us into his family. You know, to be justified is an amazing thing. To think that Christ died on the cross for my sins and I am now declared righteous, declared not guilty. I've now been made right with God. And if God had chosen to keep me at that Uh, level of relationship with him, justified through the death of his son, that would have been utterly extraordinary and praiseworthy forever uh, from us to him. But the remarkable thing is that justification was a means to another end that God had in mind. And the goal was never justification in and of itself. The goal was adoption. The goal was that we would become the children of God because it pleased him that we would be part of his family. And the reason that this is important is when we come to worship him, we're coming as children to a father. We're coming to one who has loved us so, so dearly. I find that when I worship, I'm often moved to tears. Why? Because I realise that I have a father in heaven who loves me deeply. And I'm not worshipping doctrine. I'm not worshipping a set of facts. I'm drawn close to a relationship. And the doctrine reminds me of the relationship that I'm entering into. Adoption, as J.I. Packer says, adoption is the highest privilege that the gospel offers. Higher even than justification. To be right with God the judge is a great thing. But to be loved and cared for by God the Father is greater. And if I may just read from Packer again, uh, as he uh, comments on this, he says, What matters supremely, therefore, is not in the last analysis, the fact that I know God, but the larger fact which underlies it, the fact that he knows me, that I'm craven on the palms of his hands, I'm never out of his mind, all my knowledge of him depends on his sustained initiative in knowing me. I know him because he first knew me and continues to know me. He knows me as a friend, one who loves me. And there's no moment when his eye is off me or his attention distracted from me. And no moment, therefore, when his care falters. It is an amazing thing that when we draw near to God, we draw near to a very intimate relationship. 
And if I may just quote also from uh, John Flavel, who said this, Ecstasy and delight are essential to the believer's soul and they promote sanctification. We were not meant to live without spiritual exhilaration. And the Christian who goes for a long time without the experience of heartwarming will soon find himself tempted to have his emotions satisfied from earthly things and not as he ought from the Spirit of God. The soul is so constituted that it craves fulfilment from things outside of itself and will embrace earthly joys for satisfaction when it cannot reach spiritual ones. The believer is in spiritual danger if he allows himself to go for any length of time without tasting the love of Christ and savouring the felt comforts of a Saviour's presence. When Christ ceases to fill the heart with satisfaction, our souls will go in silent search of other lovers. By the enjoyment of the love of Christ in the heart of a believer, we mean the experience of the love of God shed abroad in our hearts, which the Holy Ghost has given to us. Because the Lord has made himself accessible to us in the means of grace, it is our duty and privilege to seek this experience from him in these means till we are made joyful partakers of it. What a quote. And Flavel, the great Puritan, was saying, look, we are supposed to feel what we believe. We're supposed to be drawn into worship as an encounter, not just some sort of head knowledge of facts. So the next snapshot I want us to look at as we look at the book of Acts, what's the next thing we see that we can uh, take a picture of, as it were, and, and, and look at? Well, it's to do with prayer and mission. Prayer and mission, I would say, are the two giants uh, in, in church. They're the two giants that need to awake for God to see uh, us becoming more and more fruitful in the nations that we represent. And um, prayer and mission should be the engine rooms of church life. Everything else flows in the wake of these two things. And yet often in the Western church, prayer and mission are the two weakest areas and the ones in need of the greatest strengthening. Prayer is essential before, during, after. Every breath we take should be flavoured with prayer. Corporately, the church needs to learn how to pray. I'm very struck that when Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians to the church there, and he was describing the difficulty he was having in mission, in Asia, he was describing the overwhelming difficulties, the fact that he even despaired of life. He was describing all of this to them. And in that context, he could have asked for anything. He could have asked for money, he could have asked for a fresh reinforcements, more team. He could have said, look, I need to just come back and have a sabbatical and regroup. He could have asked for many, many legitimate things, and all of those things would have been understandable and useful. But the one thing he said to them in 2 Corinthians 1.11, when he'd finished telling them how much it was difficult for him in mission at that time, the one thing he asked for was this. He said, you also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks for the blessing granted to us in answer to the prayers of many. Paul was concerned, not that his prayer requests were sent to some specialist group of prayers, to people like Epaphras, who are noted as being those who wrestled in prayer, and praise God for people who do that. But Paul was concerned that the whole church, together as one voice, the prayers of many, became a battering ram, a force to labour on his behalf so that the blessing would be granted him that was needed to get him through the difficulty he was facing on the mission field. Brothers and sisters, we need a resurgence of corporate prayer like we've never seen perhaps in our generation. So that instead of making prayer a department or an emergency parachute or a specialism, it becomes the flavour, it becomes the strategic primary thing that as churches we give ourselves to. Praise God for our personal prayer lives. Praise God for all the books and conferences on how to have a, an intimate walk with God personally. Of course that's necessary, but most of the teaching in the New Testament on prayer is in the corporate setting. 
Most of the things we see in the book of Acts when prayer is mentioned is the church coming together to pray and ask for things because they knew that was necessary for the next phase of the journey. And in an atmosphere of prayer like that, mission flourishes. Mission starts to become fruitful. And uh, we find that mission is something that should be deeply embedded in all of our hearts. The fact that we are taking part in this conference itself shows that we have a heart for the nations of Europe, shows that we have a heart for the places where we are laboring and ministering in the name of Jesus. And I want to encourage us that mission, local and global, is something that God wants to carry in our hearts because it's in his heart. In Acts 1 verse 8, we were reminded that he, he said to the church, you know, um, you will be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. There's something in God's heart that he wants us to carry. So uh, that requires us not only to be Holy Spirit empowered, but it also requires us to go to the edge of our present experience, to go to the edge and get some new stories, to get some new encounters, some new things that God does in mission. If we always stay at the center where we are familiar, where we just do what we've always done, we may well miss this whole sense of mission that God wants to send us on. And prayer is the fuel that is necessary to be guided into the mission that God wants for us. Okay, the next snapshot that we see in the book of Acts as we just look through together. I would say the thing, uh, next one that stands out is what I would call good foundations. And by that I mean both doctrine, uh, doctrinal truth and prophetic calling. It's uh, true that in the uh, New Testament, Paul says that the church is built on the foundation of apostles and prophets. And I believe what he means by that and most scholars would believe that he's talking about New Testament uh, apostles and prophets in that context. And I believe what he's saying is that apostles lay a foundation of doctrinal truth and make sure the church is built well, the gospel is preached, that there's, there's appropriate uh, truth and validity, uh, consistency biblically in, in church life. But what he's also seeing is there is a prophetic foundation that each church needs to have laid within it. Now, what does that mean? Well, I believe it's this. Every local church has a unique thumbprint, uh, a unique fingerprint, a unique calling, a unique context. Every local church has a unique destiny in God, a prophetic calling that God wants it to fulfill within its community and beyond. We can see something of that in the letter of Revel letters uh, to the churches in Revelation, where um, John particularly talks about issues and contexts and vision and history and things that are going on in each church. And he applies different things to different churches. Why? Because every church has a unique destiny, a unique makeup and a unique contribution to bring. And let me ask you this. Do you know what the prophetic calling is on your local church. <clears throat> what is it that God has been leading you in as you've been praying, seeking him? What direction are you moving in? Paul and the other apostles we find in the New Testament were led by the Spirit. And brothers and sisters, that's what we need to be, particularly in these days where we're navigating a whole new landscape. At the time of recording this, we're obviously grappling globally with COVID and a pandemic. And there's a context to the way that to where the church is, when the church is and who the church is. There's a context. There's a prophetic calling that God has on us uniquely individually. Remember, Paul said to Timothy, you know, line your life up in keeping with the prophecies made about you. In other words, the things that God said to you has called you to make sure you steward those well. Well, what's true personally is also true corporately. There are things that God speaks to churches. He says, I want you to do this. I want you to go there. I want you to invest in this or go on mission in that area. And being attentive to that brings fruitfulness. It brings health as a local church, those kinds of foundations. The next snapshot I want us to look at as we go on our journey through Acts, looking at things that just stand out as beautiful features of the healthy church is what I've called one new humanity 
in Christ. And we notice that the early church gave both a great attentiveness um, to inclusivity and great attentiveness to diversity. We find in Ephesians 2, 14 to 20, that Paul talks there about both Jew and Gentile now being brought together as one new humanity in Christ. And the point he's making is that our previous, whatever nation we're from, whatever ethnic background we're from, whatever culture we're from, whatever our language, our tribe, our skin colour, our culture, all of those things in Christ become secondary to the fact that we are now part of God's new tribe on the earth. This is a people that's never been seen before and it's made more glorious by every tongue, tribe and nation being part of it. It's a beautiful picture that's being shown and it wasn't just a theoretical thing. It outworked in lots of ways. So it outworked, for example, in Acts chapter 6, when we found a little bit of favoritism creeping in or alleged favoritism creeping in that certain um, people were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food, perhaps they felt because of their ethnic background. And when that got to be known by the leaders of the church, they said, oh, hang on, we need to appoint some people just to look into this and sort this out because it's not reflective of who we are. It's not reflective of the one new humanity in Christ. And they attended to it. Likewise, we find that care for the poor, making sure that everybody was looked after. That was a key part of healthy church life. When Paul was presenting his gospel in Jerusalem to the other apostles when, after his conversion and when he, he emerged, as it were, from his time of solitude, um, they gave him the right hand of fellowship because they recognised, no, this guy is carrying the authentic gospel. And he says, the only thing they said was, make sure you remember the poor, the very thing that I was keen to do. So Paul was saying a very important part of apostolic doctrine and practice is that the church will always give attention to empowerment of the poor. It's part of being one new man in Christ. Whether we are doing good to everyone or specifically to the household of faith, both of which are encouraged in the scriptures. Paul gave diary time to looking after the poor. He actually delivered an offering in Romans 15, 25. He said, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going there, but at the moment I'm delivering some aid. So he, he saw it as so important that he gave, this is a senior leader, and he's giving his own personal diary time, his own uh, part of his own calling and mission was to make sure that the poor were cared for. It's important that it goes deep within all of our um, values within local church life. And then the last uh, snapshot I just want to bring to our attention as we finish our journey through looking at a healthy church that we find in the book of Acts is what I would call thriving in adversity. Now, the church, we find in Acts, was not always in seasons of persecution. We find in the early part of Acts, it said they enjoyed the favour of all the people and God was adding to their number daily. But later on in 1 Peter 4.12, we read uh, where Peter is saying, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. We find that we will both have seasons as, as churches of favour, uh, where the gospel spreads easily and we enjoy the favour of all the people. And yet there will also come seasons where the prevailing culture is hostile to the gospel, gospel message and all sorts of persecutions and restrictions and difficulties and trials may come our way. But the early church learnt this, they learnt how to thrive in both the favoured times and also in adversity. They learnt how to thrive in adversity. And whether it's living in the middle of a COVID pandemic, whether it's living with an increasingly hostile, secular, humanist uh, backdrop in the cultures, particularly of Western Europe, that is very, very increasingly uh, questioning the, the, the message of the gospel, questioning the scriptures, questioning orthodox Christian belief. And that pressure comes upon us more and more. We have to realise that a healthy church is not necessarily a church that has it easy all the time. 
learning how to thrive in adversity is a great uh, part of being God's church on the earth. We find in Acts 8.1, uh, after this brilliant start the church has had, suddenly a day of persecution came. Stephen was uh, martyred and, and a great persecution arose against the church. So the church was completely scattered. And um, we read some chapters later of the gathered church emerging in Antioch. Uh, you know, people had gone through persecution, they traveled and they'd begun to share the gospel. And so in an unusual place, through unusual people, at an unusual time, in an unusual way, God's mission burst forth again. Now, it takes us about 10 minutes to read from Acts 8 to Acts 11, where that persecution started to where the gospel broke out again in gathered church. But it took maybe 10 years for that process to take place. And sometimes the church goes through prolonged periods of difficulty where we just have to trust God and learn how to thrive in adversity. What about COVID? It's put many leaders, perhaps many of us uh, listening now to what I'm saying, many of us have been through very difficult times as local churches and as individual leaders thinking, how do we grapple with the implications of COVID and all the restrictions? Listen, God will help us thrive in adversity, just as he has done all through the generations with whatever has come to uh, challenge the church's ability to flourish. So I want to just encourage us that whether it is COVID, whether it is hostility, whether it is um, our own sense of weakness from time to time and over, feeling overwhelmed, as indeed Paul did on many occasions, God's Spirit can help us thrive in adversity. And as we come to the close of this session, and as we reflect on this conference where so many have gathered from so many nations across Europe and beyond, what a tremendous opportunity we have ahead of us, whereby with fresh vigour, with fresh consecration to the Lord, with fresh willingness, we lay our lives before him and say, Lord Jesus, we know you love your church and you want your church to be healthy and flourishing. Will you help us as we go on mission for you across the nations of Europe? Now, I trust that these little snapshots have been helpful for you. They're not exhaustive. They're really literally little photographs. It actually requires us to go on the journey in order to live in these places and to begin to make them our homes. But I trust that something of this will have encouraged you to look with fresh clarity through the lenses of the camera or acts and see what God desires for his church to be in whatever nation, whatever place we find ourselves living. May God bless us as we seek to build church for his glory.